Hello, and welcome to Scurf Interviews. This is the first of the seven episode mini series exploring some of the work of the block science team, crypto economics, and computer aided governance more broadly. To start the discussion, we have Matthew Barlin, who is a lead systems engineer at Block Science, and Jeff Emmett, who is the communication lead at Block Science, to discuss engineering methodology, what it is, and why it matters. Without further ado, here's the interview. Thank you for joining us today, uh, Jeff and Matt. And so today's conversation is going to be featuring uh, Jeff Emmett and Matt Barlin of Block Science. And so to kick us off today, I will actually just ask you guys to quickly introduce yourselves. So Jeff, if you don't mind kicking us off. Absolutely. Um, so I'm uh, currently communications lead at Block Science, uh, but my background is um, in electrical engineering. I studied uh, at the University of Waterloo. Um, and actually, when I graduated, I kind of took a hard right uh, out of engineering, but I'm glad I had that background because it really helped to um, do the deep dive into, you know, a lot of the token engineering um, work, which pulls from a lot of existing engineering disciplines, electrical systems, um, mechanical, um, you know, there's so many um, existing sort of engineering tools that we can bring into this, this new design space. So, um, yeah, I guess I can leave it at there for now. Great. Thanks. And Barlin? Hi, yeah, I'm Matt Barlin. I'm the lead systems engineer at Block Science. Uh, I've been with the company since nearly its inception, so I've been in the Web three space, or you know, probably what we called crypto back then in in 2016 and 17. Um, my original career and uh, training was as a naval architect and marine engineer. So I uh, did that for a number of years, and then. Uh, when got a master's in ocean systems management at MIT. So then was solving kind of this combination of logistics problems, moving, moving uh, things across the ocean while solving the economics and finance associated with, with, with all the uh, kind of ocean going movements. Um, from there have doing that in education and digital electronics. And that kind of all was, driving towards data and from data really kind of led me into into blockchain and as you know this this uh <laughs> this public database that we have we're now like we're at, now we have sets of public databases that that we can kind of both see and enact upon so um yeah so that's how i got to crypto web3 Great. Thank you both for sharing your journeys into the space and to, to block science. I guess a, a good place to start could actually be uh, with engineering ethics and exploring sort of what what uh, what is engineering ethics specifically, and then kind of zooming in a level to the methodology uh, and kind of why is that distinction important? Uh, so on that note, uh, yeah, Barlin, it would be great if you don't mind kicking us off with how you view engineering ethics and its role. Yeah. So as far as engineering ethics in Web3, I think there there are several principles that that we either butt up against from say like maybe the traditional software point of view, um, but then we can also bring along some of those traditional engineering um, principles that that like those of us that, that you know had had those traditional engineering uh, education that we were kind of that were um, imparted upon us. So, so uh, I might steal Jeff's thunder with like one of the things that, that I know I've heard him say, but we've all, we've heard about, you know, like in software, you build fat, you go fast and break things or, and we kind of, from the point of view of say like engineering these credit, some, some in these cases, these very critical systems that we want to go. So, and, and um, you know, uh, what not, <laughs> I'll, I'll let Jeff take the, uh, take that of, of not break things but but build things better um from like kind of the very cliche kind of s slogan for every large engineer and company about say building a better world that's where that's what kind of like the point that i kind of have to hold on to for engineering ethics because these web3 systems that we're building you know they're they're economic, they're digital, they're consuming energy, they're affecting people. And so you have to take on that responsibility. You can't 
you can't say like, oh, well, I just made this thing. And, and if it breaks or it impacts people's, you know, finances or, or even like their, their daily lives, you can't take that lightly. Um, so from like the end, from kind of a definition or, you know, how I view engineering ethics is that like, you have to, to the best of your ability with, with everything, you know, like that you already know with everything that you can possibly research and use, you know, across your team, across sets of teams to do the best thing possible, um, without, you know, imparting like any foreseeable kind of conflicts or, or bugs or, you know, um, creating this and having the view of what that system could do and what it could possibly do say in the future or under different sets of circumstances and have that, you know, be almost like a do no harm, um, uh, principle. If I, if I can just add to that, um, I think that's ultimately the, um, one of the missing pieces in Web3 today, not, not for lack of trying necessarily, but it often goes, you know, write a white paper about what you're going to do and then go straight to coding. Um, and this is a very like, um, software engineering or, you know, software is much easier to change than infrastructure. Um, when we build bridges, you know, the, the institution of civil engineering has been around for, Many hundreds uh, of years, if not you know longer, um, in in its uh, nascency, and of course, building on those models, you know, we we have certain margins of safety that need to be guaranteed. We need to make sure you know everyone who crosses the bridge doesn't have the sophistication to analyze the bridge themselves. So we need to make sure that there's sort of this um, responsibility. The the engineering ethics is basically a responsibility to society that the infrastructure that is being built is safe enough for people to use. Um, and of course, we're now talking about digital infrastructure, but it's still economic. It still has people's life savings. Um, you know, and if these things are prone to um, bugs or exploits or hacks or instability in, in any of a million different ways, um, ultimately, we are building unreliable infrastructure for society. And this is just against the, the engineering ethics. This is where um, token engineering and the engineering methodology really comes in to sort of pull in all of the um, existing tools and processes that we've used for a long time to, you know, make sure what we're building is is safe for people to use. Uh, we're just now bringing it into a new paradigm of, um, you know, economic and, and token design. And I know in an article that Michael Zargum, a uh, block science co-founder, uh, wrote on Medium, he kind of provided a definition of engineering values according to uh, Martin and Schinzinger, apologies if I mispronounced that, in Ethics and Engineering from 1983, where there's kind of four points to it. A primary obligation to protect the safety of and respect the right of consent of human subjects, constant awareness of the experimental nature of any project, imaginative forecasting of its possible side effects, and a reasonable effort to monitor them, autonomous personal involvement in all steps of a project, and accepting accountability for the results of a project. And I feel like the reality of what we've seen in so much of tech ethics, as opposed to the broad history of a lot of engineering ethics. And this, I feel like gets forgotten a lot of the time with young entrepreneurs who are just excited to go out and build the next generation of cutting edge, whatever it is, you know, in this case, systems that are not just digital play things, or like, let's all go hang out virtually, they are economically tied. So people's well beings, financial well beings are actually inherently affected in arguably a deeper way than the whole like Facebook and YouTube generation of move fast and break things. I guess, do you see in this Web3 world, is it fair to assume that there should be a higher value placed on these kind of ethics that might have not been placed as highly in the last decade? Or is that just the wrong way to think of it? If anyone's building a tool, whether it's physical or digital, always ethics just need to be a, either a starting point or very early in the process. I, I was just going to make the quick point that a lot of software engineering, you know, uh, all you need to, to update it really is is a pull request, you know, with with Git and, um, you know, Git based workflows. A lot of the time that um, sort of infrastructural design hasn't been necessary in the software domain until we have these autonomous, you know, um, independent, you know, self self executing contracts that now live on the blockchain potentially forever. Um, this is a much more difficult um, substrate to upgrade. So, you know, having the, you know, planning ahead of time, making sure that you are following appropriate engineering and methodology and in addressing all of those potential unknowns, unknowns uh, in the design stage and, and being aware of them and how to address them as you go. Um, I think it, it hits a new level uh, when we get to smart contracts and, and um, you know, digital infrastructure like, like Web3. I'd like to also kind of ex expand upon that or some, some of my thoughts of, uh, 
about that are, you know, there was that change in terminology that, that I don't know, I, I, I didn't get the memo about when, when crypto became Web3, but it happened sometime, right? But that means that we went from Web2 to Web3. And if we think about like engineering ethics in Web2, what could be improved? There's a lot, right? There's a lot about how data is used, how people are giving away their data for free, how people are giving away their, their data without their knowledge. Sometimes we're, we're, we, whether we've accepted that we are just giving away our data and we know we're being monetized and hacked and all the things that come along with it. So like in terms of how engineering ethics can be improved, say from web two to web three and whether we want to go so far as to say like, were there even engineering ethics in web two? Um, but like there, there is this thing of, of web three. So like, what are all the things can actually be done better? And, you know, I think like one of the main things is, is, you know, having this, this fresh approach and really taking that, that principles uh, to heart in terms of like, what are we doing? And some of it comes for free with, with Web3 of, of having those publicly publicly available smart contracts where you know if, if I, that you know what you're doing, or at least, you know, ideally you, you should know what you're doing. And then you're also hopefully being compensated or fairly compensated for the things that you are opting into or, or giving up. Absolutely. And I, I'm going to want to zoom into sort of where ethics falls in the overall kind of timeline of engineering or in the overall methodology. But I feel like before asking that question, it would be good to step to the, the side question of what is engineering methodology for those who are not engineers and are not actually aware of how kind of engineers think and what the education and training is like there. From a methodology standpoint, this is a, a rough idea about how we might take, say, a project from its beginning through its uh, deployment. Um, some things that you see on here, or I should say like, one thing that you don't see on here is something that uh, Eugene, you, you mentioned about kind of being able to see what, what happens in the future for say a deployed project or, or what could happen. And so we actually have like, really, this is just the, the phase through deployment. Um, but then there is certainly like stepping back one level above this is like really have the, the life cycle point of view for not only say like an individual project like this, but say like an entire protocol or like say set of blockchains where we want to like also be aware right from, from the beginning, at least have, have in mind that this is a thing that could exist and where, how long would it exist for? What would happen to say the, the code or the, the computers that are, uh, you know, say running the validation and, you know, what does that look like kind of when it, when it ends, like should it end? Um, so those are just some kind of like ideas that we might think about from, from an engineering, uh, from a systems engineering point of view. Um, so to kind of start with, say like this uh, potential project or a potential, and whether this is a, a application on a blockchain, an entire blockchain, a protocol, a set of blockchains, you know, we, we typically might start, we would start with say this like phase zero, this project baseline, where we start to uh, get a, a sense of the roles and the uh, activity and the values, value flows that might be occurring. Um, well, Jeff, Jeff might want to chime in here on phase zero. Yeah. So, and I think a lot of the the challenge is just getting really the the question very clearly understood. Um, a lot of the first steps in the engineering methodology is you know who are the stakeholders, who's impacted. Um, by this protocol, who who makes the decisions? Um, you know, what are the kind of value flows that that flow through this system, and from who to who, and on what conditions? Um, so a lot of the the sort of early phase one and phase zero and phase one is essentially just establishing your your system requirements. Um, who's involved? What kind of assets are moving, or or reputation, or what kind of flows are in the system? And then mapping all of those and understanding, uh, you know, the the basically what 
what is the the challenge that is being designed for um, and you know basically uh, you know you can almost steel man it um, back to whoever is looking to design the project because often there are um, you know even if there's a small project team coming to uh, you know block science for example with an engineering design there may be very different understandings or different um, you know the legal maybe may differ slightly from the financial may differ slightly from the technical so there's a lot of different stakeholders that we need to make sure um, are all looking at the same problem or at least um, you know they're part of the same respective problem um, and then of course there are a lot of recursive loops through this as well so even once we finish um, phase one system requirements and move into phase two of design um, there's all this back and forth sort of we we it's an iterative process um, in the engineering methodology so once we move uh, to phase two um, this is generally where um, Barlin or other um, block science engineers will get heavily involved in you know mechanism design um, and then, of course, beyond that, into validating the design to make sure that it does what we thought it would do. Um, but maybe, Arlen, do you have some more um, detail to jump into on uh, phase two and beyond? At phase one, when when like we're developing the system requirements, so like what we're really doing is we're taking, say, like the set of of business requirements that come out of phase zero, and while that has has kind of typically uh, given us a set of, say, high-level goals. Um, what we're trying to do in, in phase one with the system requirements is, is get a, get uh, not only specific, say, like it was, you know, it's called system requirements, but what we're really trying to do is say, okay, like, here is a system, here is what is inside that boundary. What are the kind of significant subsystems where, say, modular pieces we might be using? Um, and what what does this um what does that set of business requirements that we have that we have what does that actually need to look like um say within the system and what what flows maybe are coming uh or that we would define as interfaces between say actors or between say another protocol um what do those look like and defining like rigidly to say defining what that flow looks like, even though later we would, in their design, we might have refined that to be, say, like a set of actions um, and, you know, or and a set of policies, say that like maybe like a protocol uses this to say, talk to another protocol. Um, so then in the in the design phase and in, in phase two, then what we would typically be doing is, is taking those requirements, really kind of mapping out the set of subsystems that would be in play and all along what we're really doing is, is essentially ref refining and defining a math problem down to towards its solution so like into solvable pieces so we, you know so as we get to those subsystem definitions we say okay like here is this piece and now that i know how all the uh, in, inbound flows and the outbound flows, I have something that's actually solvable. And so like then really what we're doing is, is generating say like a set of, of algorithms that are really like mathematical solutions. And that kind of leads us into that kind of component design of, okay, here are all these sets of algorithms. And then we go into the system integration where we're bringing those back up and okay, now, do they still all fit together? Ideally, they 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 do, um, but like that's why we do simulation and testing to say, okay, where where does this not fit together, or where can one component say, like you know, maybe have an interaction that that over that overarches the system goal and like where the, that breaks a requirement or um, doesn't doesn't allow say like another component to um, act correctly, which goes and like once we once we move past the verification, which would really be kind of the end of the, the design phase from the point of view, say like, does the, does the math match the code? And does, does do the results, you know, do those all, um, are, are those all true? And that would be our verification. Then we go into the validation phase where we're running, say like more significant tests, looking at uh, one of the points you brought up, Gene, about kind of like, looking towards the future and like could you know how the how this could have played out under um 
under different sets of circumstances. So that's where we go into, you know, like a, a pretty significant set of simulation and, and validation there. And again, like anything that doesn't work, like, okay, that, that requires a, a redefinition on the design phase and, and maybe a, a, a re-implementation or even, you know, going back further, uh, really depending on, on what it is. But um, then that goes to like, and even that ability and that awareness that like, hey, maybe this is wrong and maybe we have to go back and fix it. That's also brings us back to like that idea of engineering ethics, right? And, and being like, hey, we need to stop. This is wrong. As opposed to like, hey, I'm going to cover it up or, and I, you know, I don't think this is right, but like, yeah, maybe nobody will notice. Um, you know, those are things that, <laughs> that we can't have and have to be aware of. Absolutely. And I guess in terms of thinking of how this really applies in the Web3 space and that you're kind of sketching out what you want, then you're designing it, then you're kind of validating uh, and checking that it's working the way that you want. Um, it would be great to actually zoom into some uh, examples, whether concrete or, or theoretical, right? But what does this actually mean when applied to a new project or a new token? Is it uh, starting from the soup to nuts of kind of why do you want to launch a currency? What is the point of it? Why do you need a token in the first place? And sort of is that first phase effectively going in uh, the whole, uh, what is it? Uh, do you need a blockchain.com? No, but if you do, fine, like we'll see what the actual tokenomics is. Um, and is that kind of the, the actual starting point or uh, given the role of block science, it'd be great to, to just get a, 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 yeah, some examples of what it could look like. That, that verb map um, does kind of take something that, that would be like, say, a nascent or like a, an idea um, and taking it from, okay, even from that, that point of view of, do you need a blockchain? Do you need a token? Do you need 10 tokens? Right. All those would, would occur there. Um, that doesn't mean, um, for block science that we can't, we can't start a project, say that's already been, um, that is more mature. Uh, that was like really also kind of where we, where we were when we made that roadmap was when, when a lot of time, when at the time there wasn't say anything built right now, we have a lot to build upon, um, but there were, but the roadmap still still applies and even in that phase zero it may not be hey like you're building a whole new blockchain or a whole new dap like even if you're building say like a new component then you can still go through that roadmap of okay what what do you want this one thing to do um what you get as an advantage for as well sometimes as an advantage for say a more more, more mature project is like like, well, you have already built components um, that you may already have to interface with. So like, so that has its own set of challenges and may, it quite often may make it um, more simple. Um, the other, other advantage you can get is that you can go, uh, that you may already have, if it's a mature project, then you also would have the data to actually test against. Um, and so that's something that we've also uh, done quite a, quite a number of times where where we might say like, hey, we want to change this thing. Okay, well, first, what we can easily do is build a model of what you already have. And so, and using the data to verify that, that the model is correct with, the, with the, the deployed system. And then we can, uh, you know, fairly, I wouldn't say easily, but like, but with fidelity say, okay, here is, Here's a model of your deployed system. Here is the change, and no, be able to like show uh, pretty clearly. Say like, okay, well, here's an A/B test to show. Okay, if you make this change, this is what will happen. Or you know, or maybe it's a a wider variety of, of tests against you know, say a, a parameter of you know Monte Carlo simulation where you're doing like hundreds of simulations to say, okay, given this change, here are all the things that could happen. Um, so we could come in really kind of like having that data or that validation. And as I mentioned, kind of that, that last phase, not on that screen where, where we would have the data to still be able to use in that, um, like kind of larger work workflow, but it might speed up some of the steps along the way. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just going to pull up another, um, common 
um, engineering diagram that um, Dr. Zargam often shares. Um, this is the um, emergence chasm. So moving from uh, the left-hand side where we have you know, our system requirements, these are the goals um, as established by, by the project. And of course, on the other side, we have the validation of uh, that system, you know, post uh, design and, and implementation deployment. Um, so you can kind of see there's, um, you know, breaking, this is another way of, of kind of looking at the progression of um, a project through the engineering methodology. So first of all, understanding the system architecture from the requirements, we break it down into subsystems or, or pieces of the problem, uh, as Barlin was mentioning. Um, and understanding the requirements of those subsystems, this is actually a, a key part of engineering is taking a complex problem into a bunch of simpler problems um, and then understanding those problems. And then of course doing your um, component requirements, you have a lot of iterations in this lower part of the V just on these subsystems. Um, so we can have component requirements and design iterations, and of course, uh, implementing them, verifying them, and implement, uh, implementing the subsystems. And there's probably a lot of loops just within that lower part of V uh, before we start reintegrating these subsystems together. Um, so one uh, example that I think is always super relevant is um, uh, conviction voting. Uh, it's interesting because it came up as a you know purely academic um, um, theory from a doctor's PhD in multi-agent robotics. He was looking at social sensor fusion. So essentially pulling over some of what um, already existed in coordinating drone swarms, for example, uh, and then pulling that into how do we coordinate humans who have you know autonomy and, and um, you know integrating social sense making. Um, and some of the early simulation and testing um, as conviction voting was going through sort of this engineering process itself, um, some of the simulations uh, you know pointed out some um, you know, it, what might be seen as obvious, but it was still really nice to see it um, sort of validated in simulation that, for example, staking when you put in a proposal on conviction voting was necessary because if there was a bunch of proposal spam, no proposal would get enough conviction to, to pass. And I forgive me if that's a little bit far down the rabbit hole. I guess that presumes people know how conviction voting works, but this is essentially a new form of um, continuous token voting that has gone through essentially full uh, engineering methodology from um, you know, mathematical theory to um, simulation to testing to implementation um, within several DAOs. So I think that's a, a great uh, sort of example of um, one such um, foray through the engineering methodology. Yeah, thank you for sharing there. And I'd be interested in terms of uh, the way you think about, right, we started off in ethics, we kind of zoomed into methodology uh, specifically. How do these two relate when, not in theory, but when you're actually working on projects? Does ethics need to be a constant lens that you apply at every single step of the methodology uh, kind of roadmap that, that you two have showed in, in kind of these two graphics and walked us through? Or are there specific milestones or times that are more or less appropriate for uh, the question of ethics to come into it? Yeah, I think, I think from like some of the overall some overall ideas that I think it, it applies is some things that actually um, work pretty well in Web three, which is like one is transparency, right? Like so we have we have public you know code code that is that is essentially running a blockchain or and sets of smart contracts that are all that are public, but like from our point of view or our work, also that needs to be we try to push for those things to be public when 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 you know we're applicable with you know where where clients agree but even like from an inter-team or intra-team point of view of we're working on something we we're, we're saying that oh here's here's the math i'm thinking about i'm writing it down here it is it's in, in a document that that you know everybody everybody that should be aware of is aware of here's the code i'm, I'm using if i'm saying this is an assumption then I'm clearly clearly stating that assumption, right, and not not letting that go, making sure that that is that is not forgotten about. Um, whether it's in code, whether it's in the math, you know. Um, and the other thing that that we can do with Web three is is you know a a thing that that we talk about a lot, at least um, for what we build is you know we we build these systems and we think of these as generalized dynamical systems and one of the things that you get in those systems is you have this admissible action space so therefore you're able to say at least and you can build in some of those those kind of blockers if they need to be there or say like roadblocks say for like okay, what can happen and you know what don't we want to let happen say um, that would say destroy a system or destroy people's lives because someone, uh, you know, was able to, to you know, ex exploit 
something. Uh, so those are things that kind of, you know, are, are there, you know, both from the, the broad sense, but like in, you know, ideally in every step of our workflow as well. Yeah. And I guess on that side, in terms of something like a admissible action space, um, how much, again, in terms of operationalizing something like that, is that a dedicated brainstorming session? Is that a concrete list that you see in turn? And once you've kind of defined the parameters of where you're intending to go into the design phase, is that literally something you need front and center or is it not that explicit? Oh, uh, we, we try to make that, uh, pretty explicit and that like as really part of that, that early systems and that roadmap of, of defining those systems where we're saying, okay, like, here's what can come into that system. And that is like, that is typically that set of actions. And like, so what are the possible actions that can come in and, you know, how, and we look at the bounds on those things and we, you know, identify those as like, whether they're, there are constraints that we need to impose or whether they're, uh, you know, say constraints of the larger system impo uh, imposed upon us. Um, yeah. So like that, that thinking is, is there early on. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to touch on and emphasize a few points, um, Barlin has already made. And, and I think that's, you know, part of the ethics of, creating these systems properly is is following the methodology. So I feel like it's it's baked in 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 some sense, at least the um, you know, under when you engineer a, a, a part, for example, for for any you know industrial machine, et cetera, you're looking at full life cycle. So I think there's a few uh, terms Barlin mentioned. So you know designing not just for launching the thing, but also maintaining the thing and understanding the time span over which is to be maintained and what happens after that time span. Are these things uh, deprecated? Does it get an upgrade? Does it get turned off? Um, and a lot of that just doesn't really, I mean, people are so excited about these tools in, in the Web3 space that, you know, the tool is front and center and all of these sort of um, things around that, you know, the, the bounds of operation. Uh, another term I think that that is core to all engineering design is, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, when you engineer a component, you're really engineering it to operate within a certain uh, range of conditions, whether that's temperature conditions, time conditions, you know, any number of things. Uh, and then, you know, you have assumptions in, for example, the materials you used or um, the, you know, the glue to hold those things together, whatever. You, you've got sort of these assumptions that are all through your design. And, of course, having a, a rigorously designed and safe uh, component, whatever it is, if it's a bridge or uh, a phone, you know, that was electrical engineering at some point, um, or uh, a, a crypto economic protocol, um, understanding the, the full life cycle, the assumptions made, uh, the bounds of operation. Um, I think all of these basically um, are, are really necessary to have, um, you know, proper rigorous design. Um, and and the engineering as engineering as a social institution um, this is where I think the ethics always has to be sort of a, a small percent of your radar because as you, as Marilyn also mentioned, when we're, you know, looking at designing these systems and we see, you know, something that could be brushed under the rug, um, this is really the, the job of the engineer to, you know, raise that issue to even if it's, you know, last minute going to deployment. Um, these are the sorts of things that need to be raised to people who are building or people who are deploying or people who are using um, these products ultimately. Yeah, I'd be really interested. I know we're slowly getting towards the the end of our time together today. And as we get closer to wrapping up, I did want to ask you both the question of, right, there's a lot of sort of uh, folks, especially when you take a topic like token engineering, who are, are coming from non-traditional spaces uh, and don't have engineering, you know, traditional kind of engineering backgrounds per se. And as there are more and more kind of different educational programs trying to fill the gaps so that there's more token engineers ready to jump into the space. And, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why that's evolving and we don't need to unpack all of that. But as there are more folks coming in who are going in and building or designing systems that people interact with, uh, given the kind of views and backgrounds that you both have, what sort of one takeaway that you wish more uh, folks who are stepping into engineering type roles who don't come from an engineering background, if there's kind of a single takeaway that they're taking from this conversation, what's a kind of a, a point of inspiration that you hope they delve into to make sure they're applying the right lenses and methodologies when they're going out and building very complex things that uh, we can see 
all kinds of fun things emerge years later that no one really planned out early on and no one would realize that would happen. If, if there's one thing I've seen people um, sort of oversimplify perhaps is that um, the whole engineering process has kind of collapsed to a single point. Um, and I think that's just basically a sort of a the state of token engineering where we're, where we're at, that a lot of this sort of happens at, for example, within block science, whereas in traditional engineering disciplines, you have a, a large pipeline of um, sort of progression of, of project from requirements to design to specification to verification to, you know, there's a number of steps that involve potentially hundreds or, or thousands of engineers and, and associated roles. Um, so I think just sort of being context aware of where we are currently at with this with this space that we're still at the stage of design that most of this can can happen within one firm but I think there's so much more um, that goes beyond just sort of the, the first order engineering um, but sort of understanding the wider sort of design space um, and figuring out you know if if engineering isn't your forte there's so many roles around that um, that really facilitate that that pipeline and I think that's where we ultimately need to get token engineering to. Uh, in the long run, where projects don't just hire a token engineer, they engage in a token engineering process um, from the get-go, um, and that probably involves multiple different um, groups and uh, and engineers and developers, of course. Um, but I think that's that's the biggest takeaway that uh, that I see uh, in the space today. Um, I'd like I'd like to add that I, th I think the other um, responsibility then from kind of the engineering ethics point of view is also that we have a responsibility for education then uh, to be able to, you know, our token engineering academy, right? Like they're there to teach others. But the, so that's, that's, you know, that's also a responsibility for us that are, that have been doing this to impart that education to say, Hey, here are the, here are the best practices. I don't know. I don't know all the, all the, the things necessary, like every single thing possible. But here are the things that I know, and, and these are the best practices I can uh, put forth and impart that upon you. And, you know, also, it also involves like also the other way, like here's a branch that actually is being ex uh, uh, being explored through Web3. I don't actually have that, that specialty. I should either learn about it, ask about it. And um, if I can't, if I can't do that um, with with fidelity, then I also, then I need to get that help too, right? To say, okay, um, like here's, here's a thing that I need help with. Um, so yeah, education, um, to really like, you know, if, if this is going to become like a discipline, um, then, then you actually need that part, you know, whether you don't need necessarily need to go the full direction of licensure or say degrees necessarily in, in token engineering, but, but still the education piece is, is uh, critical. And I appreciate you both taking the time to kind of help us kick off this wider exploration into some of the work of block science. You know, we're going to have a, a variety of your colleagues and collaborators on to talk from uh, data and measurement in Web3 to computational science to roles of formal methods, uh, some of the challenges and opportunities in governance, the community angle of all of this and computer aided governance. So I appreciate uh, both both of you taking some time today, as well as the general block science crew for the work that y'all are doing and, and adding to the space. So. Yeah, thank you all for uh, joining us and kicking this conversation off. Thanks, Eugene. It was, it was great.